Hello, everyone, and welcome to, Truck to a segment of Truck to Success here from OIDA in Grain Valley, Missouri. I'm Louis Pugh, the Executive Vice President, and the person who will be speaking tonight and giving the class beside me here and uh, smelling fresh and like lavender, <laughs> we were just, is Andrew King, part of our foundation here at OIDA. First of all, we'd like to thank all of you for signing up and joining us on here. Um, with that, um, everyone is muted due to the size of the, due to the amount of people on this webinar and stuff, everyone is muted. So if you have a question anytime, please type it into the question and answer box here on Zoom. Um, and at the end, we're going to wait till the end. Andrew's going to do his presentation. We do have a moderator that will read the questions off to Andrew and myself, and we will try to get to as many of them questions as we can. Um, this should take 40, 45 minutes. Something like that. It depends on uh, how long-winded Andrew gets. But <laughs> and, well, uh, and you. And myself once in a while. Um, also, um, we just want to remind you all, if you like this, Truck to Success, the full thing will be October 26th through the 28th. It's here just about a mile from the office in Blue Springs at the Courtyard of Marriott. They, anyone who attends in person, they are offering a discount for rooms. Um, you can attend this via Zoom also. I do encourage anyone who can to please try to come um, in person just because you get to network and it just seems like you get a little more out of it than the Zoom. But by all means, attending via Zoom is better than anything. Um, the cost for that if you attend in person is $495. That will get you lunch and breakfast and some snacks and stuff as well. For the three days, you can bring a guest. There's a small additional charge for your guest only to cover our food. If you decide to attend via Zoom, it's $250 for the three days. It's not an infomercial like you're gonna see tonight. This is an infomercial by OIDA or OIDA products or even any of our partner products. This is strictly to take you from you know, being a driver all the way through to being a motor carrier with your own authority and everything in between and the rules, the regulations, the plating, the permitting, all the stuff that you need to know. So I know it's a little expensive. I know you got to miss a week, but I always encourage people to do this because it, buying a truck and going into trucking business is probably the biggest investment of your life next to possibly your house. So when you look at it from that perspective, it is definitely worthwhile to spend a little money to make sure you want to do this. So um, one other final thing I will say, for those of you that are members or that are not members, um, we are going to run a special. Anyone who watches this, if you call in to OIDA, you got to call in to our membership between now and Friday. We will give you a $10 discount on membership for either new members or renewal of $3,500. So with that being said, um, looks like we do have somebody asking us to turn up the volume, <laughs> well, which I can't believe anybody asked me that. That, that, <laughs> that might be more on, on your end. Uh, we can't control the volume that's outputting from your computer. Um, but with that being said, let's move on to our class. Are you ready? Yes, absolutely. So uh, let's go ahead and... Um, We'll share our screen. I'll just tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, I know Louie kind of gave a, an introduction um, and hopefully everyone can see uh, the slideshow in front of you. Um, just as a little tip, if you have, are not familiar with Zoom, uh, if you are wanting to ask a question, if you move your mouse, you'll be able to see a box at the bottom and there you'll be able to click the Q&A and type in your question for those who might not be familiar with it. Um, but my, again, my name is Andrew King. I work in the OIDA Foundation Department as a research analyst, and I've been here 10 years. Actually, July uh, was my 10-year anniversary, and I actually started in the Permits and Licensing Department, and I was there for about six months, uh, and then I got moved to the Foundation. I've been there ever since. So I don't actually have a trucking background like Louie does. He was in the industry for a long time. And he'll be able to interject and share kind of his experience at times uh, and what worked for him because he was very profitable when he was out on the road. Um, but I think it's kind of interesting to have that, that unique perspective of not being in the, the background of trucking. 
Um, because I came uh, and my eyes were opened to realize how important trucking is to everything that we have. Uh, so that's just a little bit about me. Um, one other thing I do like to share just so people know and can relate to the person that's talking to them is I'm also a minister. And that's another thing that I like to uh, spend a lot of my time on. So we're going to start on uh, creating a business plan. That's what this class is about. Uh, and it's what we're going to focus on. It's kind of the first building block to if you're interested in becoming an owner operator, becoming owner operator under your own authority of where you need to start. And usually people don't like the idea of thinking about a business plan, uh, but there's a reason for it. And that's because the failure rate is very high for those who are entering into the trucking industry. So the Bureau of Labor Statistics, they keep records of the different industry sectors, and they can show through their statistics how many people succeed or fail uh, when they become a new business. And so this is transportation and warehousing sector, so it does include things outside of trucking, but it gives us kind of a snapshot. And we have in the first year of trucking, or first year of starting a business, 25% of people fail. By the second year, 35% fail. And by the fifth year, 60% fail. Now, I always have this question. Yeah. <laughs> or maybe it's more of a statement. These are transportation and warehouses. Correct. If we break this down into transportation and just trucking, in normal years, don't you feel these numbers are accelerated from what we oh, yeah. see? Oh, yeah. And that's the other part I was going to mention um, is we actually keep statistics in-house ourselves. We have a permits and licensing department, and we do help lots of people get their own authority, and we check in with them to make sure and see how they're doing and if they're still uh, running under their own authority. And I'd say for the first year, it's probably closer to that 35% mark, 30, 35% mark. So that's an outstanding number of people who do not make it just within the first couple of years. And usually when we do this, we're in a room filled with people. So if you can imagine 50 or 60 people in a room and over half of them will not make it by the fifth year, that's kind of an outstanding uh, number. It kind of makes your eyes open a little bit. And we're going to share some things that aren't meant necessarily to be negative or to uh, purposely discourage you from making this step. But we want to be realistic because the last thing we want to see is someone fail. Because like Louie mentioned, you can invest a lot into purchasing a truck, a trailer, putting everything you have into starting a business. And then one thing goes wrong, maybe you have a breakdown or maybe you, someone hits you on the road and you could be out of business. And so one of the reasons for that failure are actually three. Um, but if, well, actually, before we get to that, this next slide is just showing um, the cumulative survival rates for establishments by birth year. So it's going in five year increments, showing how from the first year at the bottom of existence, going down how, how many actually stay in business. And you'll notice that even though each one of these represents a different year, so the first was 1995, and then fast forward five more years, 2000, 2005, 2010, 2015, you'll notice the slope is pretty much the same. And I bring this up for a very good reason, because as you'll find, and many of you might already know, uh, the freight market is very cyclical. It goes up and down all the time. And it has very little to do with if you're going to succeed or not. Because you can see that throughout these years, it's following the same trend for the most part. What will help you succeed is building a good business plan and understanding your cost of operations. Because the top three reasons for people to fail, number one, is lack of sufficient capital. It costs a lot of money to start a trucking business, depending on what kind of truck you're going to get, what kind of operation you're going to do, and where you're going to haul. Uh, number two is inadequate management. And this one, um, you know, a lot of people know how to drive a truck, and they're very good at that, but they're not necessarily a good business person. Uh, I started in permits and licensing, and this is a story I always like to mention because it I opened my eyes. I can't believe that this was happening. But so when I started in permits and licensing, we would get calls and they probably still get them today where people would call in and say, I just bought a truck. Now, what do I do? <laughs> Don't be that person, because if you do, you're not going to make it. 
you need to have an understanding that you are going to be the manager now. You're going to be the owner. You're going to be responsible for the permits, the licensing, the, the taxes, the tags, all these different things that if you were at least on owner operator or a company driver, you didn't necessarily have to deal with too much. Now you are the person. And if you can't handle all of those things, then this might not be the direction for you. You, you are correct. We still get my first one of my calls when I first got here, a man called me. He had gotten his um, authority and his insurance and everything it was already good. And he called me, asked me for a load. <laughs> I, I said, uh, yeah. I, said I'm, I'm, I, I was like, what? And he goes, yeah, I'm all ready to go. I need a load now. And I said, well, we don't really do that. But <laughs> anyway, but we helped him and got him steered the right direction. Well, and that actually leads into the third reason for people to fail. And that's poor business planning. And that's kind of what Louis talking about. People call in and they say, where do I go to get loads? If you don't know where to go to get loads, this probably isn't your time to, to make this step. Um, because poor business planning is that third reason why people fail. And I just like to get back and hit on number one, lack of sufficient capital. The trucking industry and advertise is inundated with all these ads and stuff of, you know, no money down. You don't need no money. We'll sell you a truck, poor credit, bad credit, any, all these stuff to put you in business. I understand how much you want to own your own truck. I own my own for my, was whole my life dream. And I, you know, I owned one for 20 plus years. But trust me, if you don't have money and you don't have capital, this isn't the time for you to buy a truck. It just isn't the time. Right. Absolutely. And that's why we want you to be realistic as we'll go through. And as we talk about building a business plan, um, hopefully as you do that, you start to realize maybe I don't have enough capital to do this. Maybe I need to hold off for a little bit. Uh, and the question is, what is a business plan? And that's very simple. A business plan is just simply a written document that has the goals for you, for you and your business and what you want to do. And this is usually meant for those who are just starting a business, but it can be for those who already have one. And maybe they're wanting to go in a new direction, or maybe they're just wanting to see where they stand, if they're really profitable or not, because it. It's kind of surprising how many people don't realize how much it costs them to go down the road. And perhaps they're really not making any money at all, but they're actually subsidizing someone else's freight because they're not making enough. And so these are different points. And we'll talk about these real briefly uh, that you can include in a business plan. You can do research yourself and there's different elements depending on where you're looking, but these are just some basic things to, to keep in one. Uh, executive summary, company description, market analysis, marketing strategy, cost of operations, and that's where we're going to try and spend most of our time, uh, and funding request if it applies to you, if that's what you're needing, and if also it applies in appendix. And so we'll talk real briefly about some of these things, but I'd like to get to the cost of operations, spend most of our time there. Um, so an executive summary is just a basic overview of what your business is. You know, what kind of service are you going to provide? Uh, what are you going to haul? Where are you going to haul? What region? Those type of things are good to know uh, before you make this step. Uh, because depending on if you're going to buy a trailer or not, if we've had people who invest in this type of equipment and then six months later realize, okay, I'm not making any money on this. I need to go somewhere else. Well, they just made a huge investment. And they can't just go back in time. Uh, so it's a good to lay out some of those goals early. Who are you going to serve? Who are going to be your customers? And what is the future of your company? What do you want it to become? Do you just want to be a single truck? Do you want to be a fleet owner? What do you want to do? Do you want to be leased to a carrier? Do you yeah. want to have your own authority? These are all things. And I would add one thing, and this is just because I read a book lately from... <laughs> Dave Ramsey. But another thing he said in the beginning when you're doing your business plan is make a mission statement. Yes, exactly. And that's actually on this the company description part um, is, you know, again, a summary of who you are, what you're doing, uh, where you're going to run. Is it going to be local or regional? Um, what part of the country? And then, yeah, have a mission statement. What is your purpose? So for OIDA, our mission statement is to fight for the rights of all truckers. It's real short. It's real simple. But in that one sentence tells you everything about us. And it's good to have one for yourself as well to kind of put it on paper and see what exactly you're trying to do. 
operational structure. You know, this depends on how you file your business. Are you going to be an LLC? Are you going to be a sole proprietor? Who's the owner? Who's going to be the back office person if you have one? And these don't have to be anything major. They don't have to be paragraphs long. They could just be bullet points. Just keep it real simple. Uh, sometimes you, you see business plan and you think of this huge portfolio or this big folder, and that's not really all that important. Just make it clear. And what are your financial goals? What do you need to make in a year? Uh, what do you hope to get up to? And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, market analysis. This is something where people probably really don't do enough in. This goes back to the poor business planning. Um, explaining what is the trucking industry and how important it is. If you're trying to get a loan from someone who's not familiar with trucking, uh, it would probably be good for you to be able to share with them why trucking is important. And to do a little research on what is the state of the freight market. We know uh, things are going up right now. Well, they're starting to taper off just a little bit as more capacity is coming online. And depending on which segments of the industry you are in, you know, rates can be really good or they can be starting to drop ever so slowly. You know, it's good to understand that so that you know where you need to be in order to make a profit. And then the second one there, or the last one there is called SWAT. And it stands for strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And this is, I know this might seem like a lot, <laughs> but this is something that is good for you to do. Again, it's just bullet points. The top two are strengths and weaknesses. Those things are based on your internal environment. So things that you can control, things within you, within your company. What are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? Maybe you don't have a lot of experience. Maybe you do. Just kind of list those things out. And the bottom two are external factors. That's opportunities and threats. And what the purpose for this is that you can see how your strengths can help you capitalize on opportunities and minimize your threats. Whereas your weaknesses make it where you are unable to capitalize on opportunities and make you more susceptible to threats. Because there's always going to be opportunities and there's always going to be threats. Things are going to go in cycles. It's going to go up and it's going to go down. And are you able to keep yourself in business uh, when it's down is really important. Um, we'll go through these real quick. Marketing strategy. Again, do you even know where you're going to tame freight? Are you going to use a low board? Are you going to use a small shipper? Are you going to use just brokers? Uh, what are you going to do? Do you know that ahead of time? What type of freight are you going to get? And how are you going to grow your business if you want to? Are you going to use a company like OIDA that can help you in certain aspects to deal with questions that have discounts, all sorts of things that OIDA offers? Um, or are you going to use someone else? And then marketing activities. How are you going to market yourself? And that's uh, something a lot of people don't really think about. You know, when, for example, if you're going to pick a name for your company, and I've seen some crazy names that people make, and I'm sure it sounds cool <laughs> sometimes, but when you're in a professional situation and, and a shipper is to choose between two carriers and you have this crazy name and this other carrier has a professional name and that's all they know about you, they're probably not going to pick you. So just be careful on how you market yourself. Be kind, be clean, uh, be courteous. Build relationships when you go into the dock. Those kind of things resonate with people when they start to realize, hey, this guy is always on time. He's always friendly. You know, I'm going to pick him. I, I like to keep using him over this other guy. Those are ways that you can market yourself. And then this is where we're going to spend the bulk of our time is the cost of operations. And this is so very important because you can earn money in this industry and you can still fail. And I've had a lot of people who call in and they are excited about becoming an owner operator. And they say, this is how much I gross. That's immediately where they start off, how much they gross. I don't care how much you gross because that doesn't really mean a whole lot. It's how much did you save? How much did you net? And there's a phrase uh, that I coined from Louie here <laughs> and he coined it from somewhere else. I can't remember where, but, but I'll give uh, Louie the credit. This is not a money made business. It's a money saved business. In fact, actually, I was just talking to, uh, we have a, uh, a neighbor by our church is actually a member of OIDA, and I was just talking to him a, a couple of days ago, and he was talking about this very thing, that he was able to make money, but at the end of the year, he didn't have enough to really make it. And so he was going to 
closed down shop essentially because he was being able to be profitable in how much revenue he was earning, but he wasn't able to control his costs. And that is really key. And so I'd like to show kind of a, a little example of why controlling your costs and knowing your costs is important. Because if you don't know how much it's costing you to run down the road, then you don't even know what you're shooting for when you're negotiating for a rate or when you're trying to pick a load when you're looking at a low board. And that's an important point because unfortunately, <laughs> There's a lot of guys out there who don't know what the, their cost of operation is. You'll ask them and they just don't have any idea. You know, they can they'll shoot a number, but most people don't know what their cost of operation is. If you don't know what your cost of operation is, you don't even know what load to take because you don't know if it's a profitable load or a non-profitable load. Exactly. And that can get you in a world of trouble. And they have a good example of that here just a little bit. Uh, but this actually kind of shows it too. So if you have two carriers and they're earning, say this is the same load and it's earning exactly $2 a mile, the carrier on the left, the gray carrier, okay, he knows his cost of operations. And so he knows how to cut his variable expenses to kind of keep that cost down. And it is costing him $1.50 to run down the road every mile. The orange carrier on the right has no clue what he's doing. He's not uh, following any type of, um, as we'll show, some type of law where you just write it down and see what exactly you're doing, what, what it's costing you to go down the road. It's costing him $2.25 a mile. That means the gray carrier is earning a net of $0.50 cents per mile, whereas the orange carrier, he's actually paying money to run that freight. He's paying the shipper money. He's losing out and he has no idea because he doesn't know his cost of operations. And we had uh, one of the first uh, times we ever did this seminar, uh, we showed this uh, calculator, which I'm going to bring up. And one of the couples took it home at night and they were working on it. They brought it back the next day and they said, I don't know if this thing is working correctly because all the numbers are in the red. And so they asked me to come over and look at it. And I looked at it and I said, yeah, it's working. And they had this face like, oh my gosh, they had no idea that they were losing money uh, because they were not paying attention to how much it cost them to run. And so we're going to talk a little bit about fixed versus variable costs. Uh, you might already be familiar with this. These are kind of basic terms, but if you're not, just go ahead and, and talk about it real briefly. Fixed costs are those expenses that you, they're always going to be constant. Even if you're not running, you're still going to owe a uh, truck payment. You're still going to owe insurance. You're still going to owe uh, permits and licensing, things like that. Those are fixed costs that you have to pay no matter what. Uh, whereas the variable costs are things you have more control over, and they're based on conditions. So your biggest variable expense is going to be fuel. And knowing that, if you can uh, control your fuel costs, for example, uh, then you'll be sitting a lot better than if you're not. Uh, we're going to talk about net profit margin, and then we're going to talk about a few ratios that are good to know. Um, the number, the first one is operating ratio, and that one's the most important. And here, I'm just going to list them, and then we're going to talk about it because I'm, I know this is a lot that's coming at you. And that's the thing about the Truck to Success seminar. It's three days, and it's packed full of information, uh, and there's so much to learn uh, that will help us be successful, help you to be successful. We'll talk about working capital ratio, debt ratio, and debt to equity ratio. So the first one we're gonna talk about is this net profit margin. But before I do, I'm gonna bring up um, this calculator and I hope that you can see it on your screen. Uh, this is our cost per mile calculator, and you can find this online. And if you would like to have this, um, you can always send an email to, and I'll have my contact information at the very end, send an email to me and I will send it to you. And it has this introduction, explains what it's about. And this is a spreadsheet that's meant to keep your cost of operations. Here, you'll see uh, this direction to fill in the blue squares. So it's gonna ask you a few questions like how many loaded miles, how many empty miles, things like income, some of your fixed expenses, some of your variable expenses. When you fill in your information here, 
it's automatically going to make a calculation over here to show you what your per mile figures are. And we have an example. And this, these figures are taken from our yearly surveys that we do of our members of owner operators. So this is what an average owner operator uh, will make or will have. And this is meant to be an example. And as you fill out this information, it will tell you what your uh, fixed expenses were last year. Andrew? Yes. The calculator isn't visible. Okay, let me try. How about now? Yes, now it is. Thank you. Apologize about that. Okay. That's okay. So here is this calculator. I'll go back real briefly. Uh, you'll have these different tabs at the bottom, and they'll walk you through what you need to do. Here, if you fill in the blue squares, it will make the calculation for you automatically. And here is the example uh, that we have using information from our own surveys. It'll tell you what exactly you are earning uh, income-wise per mile, what your fixed expenses are per mile, what your variable expenses are per mile, and it'll add it up at the very end to show you what exactly you need to be making overall as an average to be profitable. And again, I'll have my contact information at the end of this. And through that, uh, if you can't access this by going through our website, I can just send it to you and that way it'd be easy. This also gives you something at the end of the year to look at, to see where you, like Andrew said earlier, it's a money saved business where you can cut costs and the different exactly. places that you can cut to be more profitable. And that's key is really, uh, you have a lot more control in some ways of cutting your costs than you do of, uh, I mean, you do have control on earning more income, but controlling your costs is key because sometimes the freight market will, will go down when there is lots of capacity, meaning there's more trucks than there are loads in different segments of the industry. Uh, like early before, uh, right when COVID first started, we were getting messages from people who were getting less than a dollar per mile, right? If that were to be ongoing for a time and you didn't have enough capital on hand to deal with that and you couldn't control your costs, that very well could put you out of business. Some guys even just shut down for a time just because it cost them less to do that than to keep running. But if you didn't know what you're doing, then then you'd be kind of out of luck. So did you have a comment? I was just going to say another thing I draw it down here. When you do these kind of things by keeping your cost of operations and stuff, and you write down miles, it's going to help you with purchase decisions too, because especially on wearable parts like tires, brakes, even sometimes fuel and stuff. If you keep track and good records, you might find out that, yeah, there's 250 or $300 tires are cheap up front but they really end up costing you more than say a $500 or $600. Tire. And sometimes it's vice versa. And, you know, keep me, I kept good records like that. I could tell you what tires I got better wear out of. And, you know, it's things you can learn over time. And, and again, which saves you money. Absolutely. Exactly. And we're going to talk about that in the next slide. Uh, so we're going to show the, what the big carriers make what their cost per mile is and what our average owner operator is. And that slide right there is really super important um, because if you know what, what you can do to match him, then you're sitting pretty well. Uh, so this is just an example of that net profit margin. In other words, what the net profit margin does is it shows you at what point you become profitable. So you're taking your costs into consideration in your revenue. And what exactly is that break even point because this is what you need to make in order to earn enough to support your business as well as you and your family. So this is just a, an example scenario of what you could do. So say that you had uh, a load that ran 500 miles and it was gonna pay $1.50 per mile. So you have this already, you know this uh, ahead of time. Maybe you're looking at a load board and it's giving you this information. You know, because you've been tracking your cost of operations that you're paying 92 cents per mile in variable costs and you're paying 38% per mile in fixed costs. And so you're just going to do a little simple math and you're going to run the numbers. And so 
If you take your variable cost and you times that by how many miles you're running, that's $462 and 15 cents in variable costs. You're gonna do the same thing with your fixed and then you're gonna add those two together. So that means I know, because I know my cost of operations, it's gonna cost me about $650 to run this load. But how's it gonna, how much is it gonna make me? Is it really worth it? So I know I'm gonna do the math, 500 miles times $1.50, that's going to give me a revenue of $750, and I'm going to subtract the two. And that's going to give me $96. I'm barely making $100 profit on this load. And so what you're going to do here is you're going to divide your profit by your gross revenue. And this gives you your net profit margin or contribution margin. And it means how much of your revenue is contributing to your net. And it's going to be 13 cents or 13%. And that means for every 13 cents a mile, uh, it's going to your net, which isn't very much, okay? But what if we can change our variable cost and cut it down and change it to 80 cents per mile? We're gonna do the same calculations. We're gonna run those figures. And now our net profit, because our total cost is lower, is about $160 in net profit. And let me just move this over. And so that's going to give you about 21% of your revenue is going to your net profit. It's going right into your pocket. That's much better, but it's still kind of low. What if we could do both? What if we could change our variable costs and, or I'm sorry, before we change both, maybe we can make that $1.50, we can bump it up to $2 a mile. So we have the same cost as the first one, but our gross revenue is higher. And that means 35% of what we're making is going into our pocket. That's starting to look a lot better. And if we can do both, cutting our costs and increase our income. And one thing that, uh, that Louis used to always do when he was on the road is, what does it hurt to ask for a little bit more? Always ask for more money. I don't care if you're leased to a carrier, as long as you get paid percentage or you're using a broker or whatever. I mean, if you got rates with a shipper, that's a different story. But if you're using, always ask for more money. They can all, all they can say is no. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. So might as well. And so if you're able to do both of those, increase that to two dollars and reduce your costs, then you're looking at forty-one percent of what you of your revenue is going right into your pocket and that is looking really good and one thing we want to remind you and a lot of guys forget this and gals is make sure that when you're figuring these costs you're figuring your salary as well correct you want to you got to pay yourself too and so many times people forget to figure their salary in there because i always say and i don't understand if you can make more money driving somebody else's truck, then why drive your own? Exactly. And this, this example, and we'll show you exactly what uh, uh, Louis is talking about. That's also in the cost per mile calculator. But in these calculations, this isn't necessarily something you'd have to do every time. But if you could do it a few times and you start to get it in your head, I remember we, were, we had a, a company come in and they were showing us their load board and they had some loads that were going from like Kansas city to LA or something like that. Yes. And Louie and I were looking at it and at the front end, it just, it looks like it pays pretty well. <laughs> but if you figure that out and you, you know, that's actually not a good load and it's not worth the mileage that you're putting on your vehicle and you're not earning enough to really make that a profitable run. And so sometimes people just jump at the big figure, but they don't really see the end game. Um, you know, for example, if you have a higher paying low going into Florida, what do you have coming out of Florida? Exactly. You, you got to plan ahead and understand overall, what do I need to be earning to make myself successful? And so I'm going to switch back just for a second to this calculator. What Lou was mentioning is here at the very bottom, we have a space for you pit wages you paid yourself. So after wages you paid yourself, the average owner operator that we had, this was in 2020 or 2018, they're netted to their company was $16,000. And maybe that's not really enough to make it 
And so because we've done these calculations, we know, okay, overall, this dollar seventy right here that I've been averaging over the course of the year, it's not enough. And also this cost that I'm paying is too much. Okay. And so we also, though, as we just went through the net profit margin, we all have the same thing in the calculator here where it will actually plug in your numbers for you. It's based on whatever you put over here. It will plug it in and it will give you, after you just put in your miles and what it costs per mile or what it's paying per mile, and it will tell you what your margin is automatically. So it can save you a little bit of time. And again, it's not something you need to do all the time, but it could be beneficial for you. So this is the slide I was referring to. Um, here it shows you uh, the average owner operator. And then on the, on the far right, you're gonna see the letters A-T-R-I. And that stands for ATRI, American uh, Transportation Research Institute. So I work for the foundation. The foundation is the research arm of OIDA. ATRI is the research arm of ATA. Those are the big carriers. So here I'm gonna show you some of the differences on miles and cost per mile that you have between the average owner operator and the company driver, the large, the, the big guys out there. Um, so the average owner operator travels 120,000 miles a year and that's including deadhead miles. Uh, it's not, now again, it's an average, so it might be higher, might be lower depending on what your operation is. And then for the bigger guys, it's 93,000. So it's quite a bit less. Uh, and here, fuel costs, it costs the average owner operator 63 cents a mile, whereas it costs the average large carrier 40 cents a mile. We're going to kind of come back to that later on. But you'll see on some of these figures that they're really pretty similar. There's not a huge, huge difference. In fact, in insurance, um, our average owner operator pays a little bit less than the big guy. Um, and even on they're safer. Yeah, they're, <laughs> exactly. There you go. <laughs> and then in permits and licensing, you know, some of those things are the same. Now, tires, again, that's something where large carriers are going to have a little bit more leverage. So they're going to have discounts that, that our guys would not have. Uh, and we'll save, owner operators might save a little bit more in tolls because they tend to have a little bit more control over where they run. And they can perhaps, depending on where they're running, what they're running, avoid some of those toll roads. But the big thing here, as we see the totals, and this is not including taxes and some other costs, but this gives you kind of a basic uh, overview. The big number here is the fuel cost. It's 63 cents uh, opposed to 40 cents. And that makes a huge, huge difference. That yeah. And there's a couple of things that come into play here. Yeah. Um, one is big fleets, unfortunately, or, fortu or fortunately for them, unfortunately for our operators, a lot of times have more buying power so they get a bigger discount truck stops and stuff with the small guys do that's where you know we recommend you try to find yourself a fuel card we here at oid have a pretty good fuel card there's some other fuel cards exactly. out there um myself i ran a credit i had a fuel card here plus i had a, a credit card i got a cash back deal five percent cash back so there's all kinds of different ways you find say man Another way, and you know, I was guilty. Most a lot of interrupters are guilty. We like to drive big hooded trucks that are like a brick and don't get very good fuel mileage and big horsepower. That's where the fleets really get you. In fact, in 2008 to 2008, 2009, 2010, 11, all that, when everything was going crazy, I came due for a new truck in 2011 for when I wanted to buy a new truck. And when I did, I finally switched over to a fuel efficient truck a more sleek aerodynamic truck. Uh, the savings in fuel almost paid for that truck. So it does make a big difference, but it wasn't as cool as the trucks I had before. <laughs> I will say that, but at the end of the day, I was able to buy a lot of to toys that look cool in the savings. Well, and that's, that's one thing about the business plan is be, being realistic and understanding, okay, that's something I would like to have, but really if I want to be successful, Maybe it's just not going to work out for me. So if you write, can write some of these things out already, uh, then you can be a step ahead of the game and realize, okay, that's not going to work. I'm going to have to take, I'm going to have to change something and maybe look for something a little bit different. Yeah. And again, it's all give and take too. I mean, if you're a yeah. person who wants a big hooded truck and all that stuff and that's your life and that's because there's a lot of guys like that and I get it. 
you know me i like to play motorcycles and old tractors and stuff like that that was more you know my truck paid for that but if you if the truck's your thing then you know we're not saying don't but that's just ways that you can seem really at the end of the day that dollar 22 to that 96 this is one of my favorite slides the the 96 cents a mile is what's setting the market out there especially on contract rates Right now, spot market rates are really high because of volume and stuff, and we're not going to really get into a lot of that. But with that being said, that's where you got you got to try to get as close to that number as you can if you really want to compete, especially when times get really lean. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Because you never know just one little thing, and that can put you out of business. So being able to control your costs is really important. Uh, so we're going to move forward into the operating ratio. Uh, and this one is probably of the four ratios I mentioned. I would spend more time on this. I probably will skim through the others because we're moving, we're getting kind of close to the hour mark and I want to be able to answer your questions. Um, and this one is probably more important than the others. And it's also one that you might be more familiar with. Maybe you've heard before. And this is essentially showing how efficient you are at controlling your costs while also generating revenue. And this is something that people will look for. It's an industry standard. Uh, large carriers are always talking about their operating ratio. Uh, in fact, uh, I was just reading an article just uh, yesterday about TFI when they, they purchased UPS freight here and changed it just to earlier this year and how they were going to change the operating ratio for the second quarter. And this is simply calculated by taking your total operating expenses and you divide it by your operating revenue and you times that by 100 and it's going to give you a percentage. And this is something you're going to want to check uh, every so often, maybe every three, six months, something to that effect, maybe once a year, maybe a little bit more than that. If your operating ratio is going up, that's a bad sign. That means your expenses are getting too high and or your revenues, revenue is getting too low. What you want is you want a lower number. The lower the number, the stronger you are as a carrier. And I'm just going to give an example here. Um, so we have a carrier here, and we know that his total expenses, because he's been keeping track, is $150,000 uh, over the course of a year. His operating rate uh, revenues are $200,000. He's just going to divide those two together and times it by 100, and that's going to give him a number of 75%. And that means that 75% of his revenue is going to cover expenses. And that actually, you might think that's kind of high. That's actually pretty good for an owner operator. Most of your large carriers are gonna run at like 90% or 95% and sometimes they go above it actually. So if you go above 100%, that means you're losing money. But they can do that because they have such a big market share. That's the game that they're playing. For you as an owner operator, you're going to have one truck or maybe a couple. You can't do that. That's going to be too pricey for you. You've got to be able to control your costs. And one way to see where you are in that, to see if you're doing that in an efficient way, is doing this calculation that I'm showing you right here. And this is something that's also available uh, on the spreadsheet that I showed before. It's going to have, well, we'll just one second, we'll just switch over to it. Uh, so if you go over here to the operating ratio, it's going to give you a little information explaining it. But in the example, it'll do it for you. If you play with the numbers, it will tell you what your operating ratio is. So we'll go back. I don't know why. Oh, there we go. Sorry, there was something popped up on the screen. Um, we're going to go through these other ones really fast. So if it's, it's going too quick, I apologize about that. Um, but just so we can make sure to answer your questions, uh, we're going to go through these fairly quickly. The working capital ratio, or in other words, it's also called a current ratio, is just trying to show how much working capital you have on hand for immediate needs. So this is kind of gauging your financial health. If something bad were to happen, say, like, for example, uh, Louie had an issue when he got the Max Ports uh, engine, 
right? Where you were down quite a bit. Yeah, downtime, good <laughs> for sure. <laughs> and so if you if you that might happen and you're not expecting that at all. If you don't have enough capital on hand, some cash on hand, three, six months on hand to pay for your expenses, even though you might not be running, uh, that would be a problem. And this ratio helps you to do that. It just takes your current uh, takes your current assets divided by your current liabilities. And by current, it means anything within a year. So things that you can immediately transfer to cash, those, those are your assets. Current liabilities are things like short-term debt, uh, uh, your taxes, permits, things like that that you're going to pay uh, within that 12-month time frame. And this is going to give you a ratio. And so, for an example, if you had a carrier who had 250000 in assets, they had 300000 in current liabilities, that even just there, just looking at the numbers, it'll show you they obviously have more liabilities than they have assets. So they're not going to have a good ratio. If it's less than one, that means that you are losing money. You have more liabilities than you have assets. So if something bad were to happen, say you get into a car wreck or something happens unexpectedly and you have a mechanical breakdown, you might not be able to make it. And that's, that's no small thing because that stuff happens all the time. You can't control what might happen or what someone else might do to your truck or what might happen to your business. Um, so you want to keep that number. That number should be between like 1.2 and 2. Uh, you don't want it too high because that might show that you're not really using your assets efficiently. At least that's what other people say. Uh, the next one is the debt ratio. And this is kind of showing how much of your company, how much of your, your assets are leveraged by debt. So this is, you're only gonna take your debt and your assets. This means you're not taking any of your liabilities. Liabilities are things that you owe. Debt is something that you repay. So if you had a truck, for example, that you already had, um, that you're still paying on, and you wanted to go back to the bank to buy a trailer, well, this is something that they're gonna look at to see what debts you already have and can you pay them off. So you're just gonna take your total debt divided by your total assets. So again, a real short example, I have Carrie here who has $150,000 in debt and they have $250,000 in assets. They're gonna divide that and they have 60%. That means 60% of their assets is leveraged by debt, which is really high. You want that number to be lower, uh, somewhere around 20 to 30% or even lower than that if you can. However, because trucking is a little capital intensive, that might not necessarily be a bad thing because that debt, I know we're kind of more of a Dave Ramsey guy and we're not a big fan of debt, <laughs> but sometimes debt uh, also helps you generate money, revenue. And so in that case, it can be beneficial as long as you have a return on investment. One day you pay it off and it gives you more than what you put in. Uh, the very last one is debt to equity ratio. And this is kind of similar to the debt ratio, except this is looking at long-term and it's looking at everything overall. So total liabilities is things that you owe and things that you pay. It's, it's both your expenses and your debt. And it's gonna be divided by your equity. So you're gonna to have to find your equity first. And we'll just make this real quick. And this is the last one that we do. Um, $200,000 is their assets. And they're going to subtract that by their liabilities to find out what their net is or equity. So in this case, they have $50,000 in equity. Now that we have that number figured out and we already know what their liabilities are, we're going to divide the two numbers together and you're going to get a figure of $3. That means for every $3 of debt, they have $1 of equity. That's not a good figure. Uh, again, that's something that you, this might not be something that you necessarily need to do per se, but if you're going to get a loan from a bank or some other kind of institution, this might be something that they look for. The most important of all the ratios I'll share with you is the operating ratio. And that one will show your efficiency and it's a little bit easier to do. Um, the last part of but the funding requests, or I'm sorry, the business plan is funding requests. Um, projecting your budgeting needs and creating a profit and loss model. Um, this is just an example. 
So if you're starting a business and you are trying to figure out how much it's going to cost you, how much money you need uh, to, to get a loan for, you can take some of these figures as just an example of what it's going to cost for a new truck, a new trailer. You'll have this uh, month's column, what it's going to cost you per month, what it's going to cost you over the course of a year, and the final column is what it's going to cost you over the course of the loan. So you'll notice this $100,000 truck, by the time you pay it all off, is actually going to cost you $141,000. Uh, and then you can see the same thing with the trailer and you can see your costs that are going to be for insurance and licensing. And this tells you that these costs are not small by any means. This is going to be what you need to try and start a business. Uh, or maybe it, you have a truck already and you want to add another truck to it. So maybe after looking at something like this, you say, OK, $100,000, that's too much for me. Maybe I should look in more used market and something much lower. Or better interest rates. Or better interest rates, which unfortunately there's not a lot of uh, uh, oversight, I guess, on that. Um, but that gives you a little bit of information. We're going to flip through some of these last part so that we can get to your uh, questions. This is the last slide um, other than the questions. And this is just the overall thing of what your business plan should be. It should be simple. It should be understandable, should be readable and realistic. It doesn't have to be 20 pages. Um, it could be just a few pages and just having bullet points. The point being that when you start to write this stuff out, uh, then you have a better understanding of what exactly goes into a business. And if this is too stressful for you, then maybe you don't want to go any further. <laughs> okay, because this is this is like the small part of truck to success. Uh, I love to tell the story. The first time we ever did it, we had this guy who came in. He's like, I'm going to be an owner operator. I'm going to be a fleet owner. I'm going to have three or more trucks. And, and that's what uh, my business plan is or his goal was. By day two, he's like, well, maybe I'll just operate. I'll just have an owner. I'll be an owner operator under my own authority. I'm just going to have me. I'm not going to do a fleet of trucks. That's too much. By the third day, he said, no, it's just not the right time for me because there's so much information and this is just a small portion of that but that's a win i mean it's a lot better to yeah. find out before you make this huge investment that maybe this either isn't for me or the right time for me then wait until you know like i said then go out and spend all this money and then find out oh i really messed up exactly so this is the final slide it's got my contact information uh, it also has a link if you want to write it down to the Truck to Success uh, page, if you are interested in registering. Um, do you have anything to add, Louis? Yeah, well, real Questions? quick, while Andrew has that up, and this is going back to, and we'll get any questions, but a, a person on Facebook asked if we could give examples of cost of operations in areas of this, in different areas of the country, and also list different expenses, not just fuel maintenance and cost. As far as listening, when we do these surveys and stuff, we don't have it broke down that far. Not really quite like that. I for mean, for the areas, and that's a little tough because you may live in one area and truck in another area and stuff like that. And then it also depends on your operation. You know, flatbed industry is better than the Rust Belt than it is in the in the Western Mountains and different stuff like that. So there's a lot of variables to that. That's a little hard to do. As far as expenses, I don't know if you saw the thing that Andrew put up of our expense thing, but it does list a lot of there and shows you all the different expenses and stuff. You can add in and you can, add, you know, there may be more you want to add yourself. So it's there. We just didn't dig that deep down into it. Right. And that's another good reason I like to say it's good to attend truck to success in person because during breaks, lunch, breakfast, there's all kinds of networks. When you have stuff like that, we can dig deeper into that. We're close here to the office. We can even bring somebody over to the office to talk to you or bring you to the office. Exactly. So with that, that's all I have yeah. other than what Andrew's contact or you can contact myself. With that, let's move on to the questions from our moderators. Andrew, at the beginning of your presentation, you talked about birth year. Was that the birth year of the company or of the founder? 
<laughs> of the company. Sorry, yeah, of the company. I was gonna point that out. Uh, I didn't think about. Yeah, it. I'm sorry. Probably should put that the in there. Bureau, yeah, the Bureau of that's directly from the Bureau of Labor Statistics <laughs> and Government. Is it? You know, they do things a little bit differently. So yeah, it, it means by birth year of that company. Sorry. Oh, that's fine. Thank you. Um, the next question is, how do I get the spreadsheet? Uh, if you will email me uh, at Andrew underscore King at OOIDA.com, I will email you back with a copy of that spreadsheet that you can use. Or if you're not email savvy, you can yeah. call, you, yes. call here you to the can. office at 800-444-5791. Ask for Andrew. He does answer his phone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, the next question is, uh, you didn't comment on how someone gets paid. Do you use a factoring company or do you just take your chances? That's a good question. That, that's a very good question. We get this a lot. There's going to be, everybody's got their own point of view. At the end of the day, if you're your own carrier with your own authority, a lot of times, unfortunately, factoring companies aren't a good way to go because they'll tell you there's non-recourse and all this other kind of stuff. And if you dig deep down into their contract, you'll find out that that's not quite true. We always encourage anyone, if you're thinking about factoring, send your contract into our business service, our compliance department. It's free for you as a member. You know, you, you send them the contract, they'll look over it. They see hundreds of these things a year. Right. They'll tell you the good, the bad, and the ugly. Now, some people, of course, they need to use a factoring company as a stepping stone. We're not saying not to use one as a building, but you don't want to get yourself to where, you know, the factoring company becomes like the company store and you're a slave to that factoring company. And so many times, unfortunately, we see that happen. Now, if you can get yourself with the right factoring company, and maybe you're a single person and you don't have time to do all your billing and stuff. So if you can use it to your advantage, that's everything. What work, That's where trucking is so crazy. What works for me doesn't work for the next guy. But what you always want to be looking at is what's the advantage? What's the return on the investment? If you're getting more return on investment from a factoring company, then by all means use them. But if you're using the factoring company as a bank, and, and, and stuff like that, then you, you, you shouldn't be using a factoring company at all for like that. You're just setting yourself up for failure. Essentially, you're paying them to get your money you know, for you. So it can be like Louis mentioned, they can be a, a, a good, they could be a necessary evil, I guess, in some cases. And that's something you'd want to put in your business plan on how you, you want to grow. Uh, is that something that you need to consider and look into? Next question, with the EPA regs changing every month, would it be better to lease or buy a truck? <laughs> well, with the EPA regs, I get it, but they don't change monthly as far as what you have to do. I mean, the last big change we had was in 2011, and we can argue good or bad. But with that being said, there was more to come, of course. You know, probably by the time the next change, if you started in trucking today, you'll be due for another truck by then anyway, or rebuilding the truck you have. As far as whether to lease or purchase the truck, a lot of times that comes down again to your business model, your tax situation, your money situation. That's where you need to get yourself a good tax preparer who understands trucking. That's a, that's a key thing. Lots of tax preparers out there, but trucking is its own animal. So you wanna find one you know, and that's another thing that we spend a lot of time talking about in Truck to Success. But, but again, it's hard to answer that question without seeing your finances. It's like whether you should incorporate or not. Right. But on, uh, I don't know if you want to touch on lease purchases. Yeah, don't all. lease purchase. Don't, don't do that. Yeah, leasing, we mean as lease, we mean as a business lease from a bank or from a lender or something like that. Not a lease purchase from a trucking company. Right. That we that the failure. I mean, there, again, there's always an exception to the rule, but I would say 99.9% of people you will fail. It's uh, it's very sad the amount of cases and the bad things that we hear in a lease purchase. Exactly. Is the insurance figure that you gave for an owner operator leased or a one truck motor carrier? Uh, that's for it's actually both. It's not broken down that far. Um, it's just kind of an overall owner operator. So it includes both 
but obviously uh, insurance, I mean, if you're leased on to a carrier, that might be kind of different on how that carrier chooses to do it because you're going to have your primary liability through them. Uh, if you're an owner and operator under your own authority, obviously that's going to be a, one of your big costs. Yeah, I mean, you're looking at a first-year motor I mean, it's crazy. You're going to probably, as a first-year motor carrier, and when it comes to your primary liability, it doesn't matter if you've been driving for 30 years and you have any accidents or anything, you're still new. It starts over, and I know it's crazy and it stinks, but, I mean, we, not OIDAs, of course, but we have seen quotes come in here from other insurers as high as $50,000 for first year. So, I mean... Probably you're looking at 15 to 25, I'd say roughly, depending on your thing, if you have to buy primary liability. Of course, if you're leased to a carrier, like Andrew said, they furnish that, you're paying physical damage and stuff, which is a lot less. I think my physical damage when I got off the road in 2017 was around $100 and $150 a month or something, which I was fortunate. I've been with a carrier company a long time had no accidents. Of course, insurance rates have went up. That, that's another reason we always try to suggest you kind of go in baby steps. You buy a yeah. truck, you lease to a carrier, you build some capital, learn the business, then become a motor carrier and, and take on all these other responsibilities and, and, and fees. Um, this person came in late and would like a recording of the webinar. And that will be available on our YouTube channel later this week, correct? Yes, that is correct, Angel. Thank you. I'm going to hit on that in just a minute, but you are correct. And um, as for a copy of the spreadsheet, you can email Andrew at Andrew yep. underscore King at OOIDA.com, or you can call him. Andrew King at 800-444-5791. Can we throw Andrew's contact information back up on there? Uh, if I can share my screen, um, I will go to the inside there. Or again, you can always just call into OIDA at 1-800-444-5791. You can ask for Andrew, you can ask for me, uh, you know, or someone, we'll get that to you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, the next question is, as far as controlling cost, will an increase in liability insurance to $2 million stop new startups? Uh, yeah, well, that's a little <laughs> it's going to make it a lot harder on new startups. I, I, you know, we don't necessarily think it's going to stop everyone or anything. Nothing ever seems to do that, of course but it will make it much more costly. That's why OIDA continues. You know, our number one thing here at OIDA is advocacy for our members. And that's why we continue to fight that fight in Washington, DC, but anything is possible. Next question. If you shouldn't use a factoring company, how would you go about seeking payment for loads yourself? Um, you'll, do, you'll bill your customer. I mean, Good thing is, is try to find yourself good, solid contacts, especially if you've got friends, if you've got family. And this is some of the stuff we discuss later on in Truck to Success on how to find freight and stuff like that. But if you've got some contacts and freight people, try to find business on. They're always correct to run credit on businesses and stuff oh, yeah. to make sure they're credit. And then you bill them and you set up on your contract. I mean, a lot of times you're going to be 30 days out and stuff. Again, yeah. that goes back... So you've got to have capital. And I, you know, the first job I ever had with my first truck, I was leased to a carrier. And unfortunately, the carrier I was leased to didn't follow the leasing regulations very well, nor did I know what leasing regulations even were because I was a dumb 22-year-old kid with a truck. And, you know, I didn't have anything like this. And I went four weeks before I got my first pay. Mm -hmm. Now, once they got after four weeks, you got paid every week. But again, that's why you need to make sure you have capital. Because if you go into this with people loaning you money that you don't have to buy trucks, loaning you money to pay, collect on freight bills and all these other things, you've got too many hands in your cookie jar. And that's what you want to do is figure out how to get as many hands out of the cookie jar because they're all going to take a chunk of your bottom line. Right. The last question is, does OIDA recommend having a CPA or do you have CPAs that you can recommend? 
We do recommend you have an accountant. I do recommend that you get an accountant who understands trucking. Yeah. It's very important. Like I said earlier, trucking's its own animal. There's a lot of different weird deductions and stuff like that. I would, I never did my taxes myself, nor would I ever. Now, with that being said, if you do these cost of operation, a lot of stuff we tell you, you can keep your own records. That's what I always did. And at the end of the year, I took all my records to my accountant who was very well versed in trucking and he, and he figured up what my tax debt was, but that's very important. Yes. Because lots of guys get themselves in trouble as well by, by not being prepared for their tax debt. Don't we refer? Don't we have people we refer? Yeah, we do have accounts here that we refer. In fact, one of the accounts um, actually comes here and does truck to success with this Barry Fowler. Yeah, it's uh, Truck Taxation, taxation solutions. solutions. He's out of Houston, but he can work nationally with you. And Barry does a really, really good yeah. job. Whether you want to use Barry, you want to use somebody else, that's fine. But if you do attend the regular truck to success, you will meet Barry. Like I said, he does come here and does a really good job. He's always happy to help OIDA and their members. Yeah, that's probably one of the best segments. So do we have any more questions, Angel? Um, I think that's it. Do you have any on Facebook, Narita? Uh, no more questions on Facebook. Um, I'll just direct your attention to the chat where I uh, pasted in a link to our YouTube channel and a link to the Truck to Success page. Put us over here. Can you do that? Put us so we, they see us? Uh, yeah, I can stop sharing. Uh, All right, Narita, thank you. And um, I'd like to thank everyone again for taking time and join us this evening. I hope everyone's staying safe. You know, remember, if you're not a member of OIDA, our number one thing here is advocacy to help you. Um, love to get some feedback if you like this, if you'd like to see more stuff like this from OIDA. You know, besides our advocacy, we have lots of stuff around here. If you are a member and you don't realize or have a, or not a member, you know, we have a magazine, we have a radio show, a landline now and road dog every night by once every other Wednesday, we have live from exit 24. We have safe driving. We have destructive success seminar. We have scholarship program for members, children, a lot of other business things and discounts here at OIDA, I encourage you to participate in. Um, you can always call me if you have any questions or any problems. If you're a member or not and want to be a member or whatever, our business services is very there to help you anytime there's contracts or questions about business and this kind of stuff. By all means, reach out to them. Finally, Andrew and our foundation, they do wonderful research and education. If you get on OIDA.com and go to the education link, there's all kinds of free videos there that you can watch. Love for you to watch them. Um, I encourage everyone who's thinking about buying a truck, or even if you've bought a truck and you're wanting some tips or more help, you know, please think about attending Truck to Success. Uh, again, it's October 26th through the 28th, the last week in October. Um, you can get online. You can call me. You can call Andrew. Call you to get more information. Again, the hotel offers discounts. Um, it's You get uh, lots of knowledge from lots of experts. It is three full days of knowledge. I encourage you to bring a guest. Andrew, do you have anything else? Oh, I think that covers it. With that, I would like to thank our moderators, which was Andrew Burnell, our chief of staff, and Narita Taylor, our PR director. I'd like to thank Andrew from our foundation for all this wonderful knowledge. I'd like to thank Aaron Phillips, who's hiding back here in the corner, <laughs> and our IT department to make sure the computer and everything works. I would like to, and most importantly, for myself and all of us here at OI Day, we'd like to thank all you truckers for everything you do. And one other thing, like I said, this will be on YouTube and it will be on Facebook. If you got a friend or you want to watch it again or other friends, please share it. And again, let us know how you like this. Feel free to call me anytime. And thank you and be safe out there and enjoy the rest of your evening.